rolling. We're back on the record at 1.58 p.m. Just confirm, Mr. Balwani, you didn't have any substantive conversations with the staff during the break. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So I wanted to compare the two reports briefly that you have in front of you at 239 and, and 241. And if you look at the um, third page of 239, okay. um, it, it looks like there's infectious disease panel test one and test two. Do you see that? Yes. And on test one, it um, looks like mumps is negative, and on test two, it's positive, right? So you um, um, Oh, test panel, test number one and two. Yep. Okay, I see that. Um, and, and, and these are both listed as, uh, as qualitative units. Correct. Did you have an understanding of what that meant? At the time? Yes. W yes. What does that mean? It's either positive or negative, or, or yes or no. Qualitative is that, and quantitative is where you actually get the digits. The, um, and if you take a look now at um, the test report at 241, if you look at the first page there, um, the mumps is listed as positive and qualitative. Do you see that? See that? I guess for, for, for a qualitative test, what would be the, as you said, you run the same blood twice in the same machine, you might get two different results. And yes. It, it, it's a matter of the ranges. For, for, the, for, the quali for a qualitative test like mumps where it's either positive or negative, what would be the situations in which you can you know, know which one of the two tests is correct and, and pick between positive or negative like this? What is different for R&D than clear lab? I'm assuming you're asking me about R&D. Sure. For yeah. uh, R&D could be, you know, 100 different factors. It could be the confidence of the guy who ran the test. It be, could be the confidence of the guy who said, you know, I used a different method or different reagent or different reagent lot the second time. You know, there are a lot of factors that go into, you know, in R&D, well, how would you pick the, pick the uh, answer? There's also a, uh, a protocol in CLIA uh, that sometimes R&D people follow, which is if you get two results which are different, uh, you either pick the first one or the second one, uh, unless it's a test that, you know, like I said in this one, which is most likely 95% are positive, so, so there are certain decision criteria that go into that. Uh, my guess is, I mean, this is my understanding, again, high level understanding. So my guess is that's the kind of level of thinking that would go into something like this. What about in the CLIA context? If you if you if you, you got a sample that you ran twice and you got you know two different two different outcomes, how how would that be addressed in the CLIA context? Well, first of all, uh, in CLIA, the assay would be way further along, right? So the assay is not going to go live in CLIA unless your confidence level is not high, not just high, but has been validated by the lab director. So there's a day and night difference. I just want to point out that in, in like a, you know, think about our, uh, iPhone 10 that Apple may be working on. You know, things will work differently when it's in the hands of Apple and R&D versus when it's in the hands of the consumers because it has gone through a certain process. So the reason the processes and SOPs are different in CLIA is because of that very significant reason. In CLIA lab, like I said, there are usually SOPs that lab directors have put in place. Now, they have a right to modify them anytime they want, but Usually they'll say for these assays, if you run it the first time, if it is positive, then run it again to confirm it as positive. For certain tests, uh, there's actually protocols defined by CDC. You have to follow those, like HIV and some of the more, more uh, dangerous or not more, more um, complicated infectious diseases. There are protocols on CDC's website. You just follow those. And for different types of tests, the lab director may have set different rules, but then that becomes part of the SOP. The CLIA lab gets trained. If it is in the software, then it gets implemented in the software also. Uh, and then our software just automatically makes the decision on behalf of lab director. Uh, and was that generally your understanding throughout your time that Theranos had a, had a CLIA lab? 
Yeah, I mean, I, that's my understanding of the, uh, how things work in the CLIA lab, and I think it's reasonably accurate that the lab director will have those policies in place. Uh, because this uh, instance of, you know, you're running something once or twice, uh, it's a common thing in CLIA lab. The clinical lab staff may run it twice for, you know, different reasons. Sometimes, uh, you know, sample just to confirm a test before they, you know, before they should, uh, release the results. So there are a lot of different pathways of why things would run twice in CLIA lab. And lab director usually, for every essay, would have those policies in place, and essay by essay in most cases. And for, in, in the CLIA lab context, again, would there, would there ever be a reason where um, Ms. Holmes would have the final say on whether to correct a reference range or adjust a reference range? She would not have, in my opinion, the final decision on the CLIA lab. It, it is possible that uh, sometimes when you bring up tests in the CLIA lab, when you set the reference ranges, you start with a narrow big, uh, number. I think the minimum is 20 uh, for most assays, sometimes actually even five. You know? And you basically get five pa patients and you run them and you get some data and then as you get more and more patients, it gets broader and broader and the reference range gets better and better. So it is possible that, and I th theoretically I'm talking, I don't know whether she did that or not, but the theoretically that if you had set a reference range and the result seems off, uh, or is on the borderline or out and the, pa and the doctor or the patient has a reason to believe that no, your results is challenged, you know, take a look at it again, then you'll say, you know what, this one, we don't have enough samples, let's add more samples, see if the reference range changes. But again, in the CLIA lab, lab director is going to make the decision, uh, Ms. Holmes can probably make a recommendation that please try to do that. Uh, and sometimes even I would make a suggestion because I knew that for assays where your sample wa size was, sample uh, population was l less you could make things better. I mean, that's what CLIA Lab does. This is why they have LDTs, the lab developer tests, for that. One of those reasons is that reason. And I guess how that how that um, adjusting the reference range fit in within the uh, the SOPs that you described? Well, no, it will be lab director who will do that. It's not going to, uh, the SOPs will be at the high level that if you have a reason to adjust the reference range, and I'm, again, I'm not particularly familiar with the exact SOP, but I am familiar enough at the high level that the lab director will say, if there's a need to modify the reference range, here's the process. In CLIA lab, there's always uh, uh, a process or well, a uh, well-defined document that tells you to do pretty much everything. Uh, and uh, you know, that's the that's the right approach. Once, once Theranos started um, modifying commercially available machines, did. Did you ever tell any recipients of the uh, of demonstrations that their tests would be run on commercially available devices? But these devices would not be commercially available, first of all. The ones that we modified, they went through so many changes using our proprietary technology, they're no longer commercially available would be the first thing. The second thing is, the answer I gave you earlier, no, we would not tell anybody because of the trade secret point. Uh, just pointing somebody that, uh, you know, uh, by modifying Toyota Prius's engine, you can go 500 miles a gallon would be a big violation of our uh, uh, trade secret, so we would not do that. Can I just ask a couple other questions? So if you go back to um, 239, so looking back at the comparison of test um, number one and number two, and you look at the results of the measles and rubella test results, you know, for test number one, measles is reported at 42, and rubella is at 10. And then for test number two, it's at 139 for measles and 62 for rubella. Those seem like very uh, different results. Um, in, in that kind of situation, you know, what, what would be the procedure as to figure out which of those two is more likely to be the accurate result? Just to clarify, are we talking about CLIA lab or R&D lab? Uh, is it, would it be different? It'll be, I was gonna ask the same question. Okay. It's very different uh, for clinical lab. Clinical lab, is a, a, they, there's a clear SOP that says, if you ran the test the first time, right? Let's say, first time your result was 42. For whatever reason, you decided to read on it. It doesn't matter what the reason. The next time the result comes to 139. If you don't have a reason to run it the third time, always report either the first or the second. There's SOP for that. You cannot pick in clear lab. Like, mm, 130 is better. There's no better is the big point here. Because if I test you twice right now, uh, within five minutes, there are some tests which will be significantly different. 
if you just walk around the block, your test, some tests will be completely different. So if there is a reason to read on a test and the results are different, there is no one that's better than the other. They're just different. And this is why in CLIA lab, you will have an SOP that says, you know, always report the first one. If the second one gave you enough information to give you confidence in the first one, and this is my understanding and I think is reasonable, that there's an SOP that says pick the first one. Right? Now, lab director has the right to override it, of course. A lab director may even have a general supervisor override it or a CLS override it. That happens in the lab, uh, but, but that's the process. But there's always an SOP for that. Okay, and what about in the R&D context? Well, like I said, in R&D, because things are being in the research mode and the R&D mode, there is no SOP because then there's not R&D anymore, right? So uh, it will depend on the chemist, on the scientist, on the guys who are doing the uh, number crunching. May even be uh, it may depend on the software developers. As a matter of fact, if you look at 240, all the way at the end, the last page, the first people on that uh, email is this lady Sandhya, and she was a software QA person. So even somebody's reaching out to her saying, "Hey, did you run the?" panel and how did things work out, did everything work out okay. So there are a lot of people who can provide input and based on that you have a certain confidence that you report out uh, the test. Okay, so if you look at 241 then, uh, you know, in terms of the results for those two runs now, they've actually been changed instead of quantitative results, they've been changed to qualitative so that measles is being reported as positive and rubella is being reported as positive. Right. Um, Why was it appropriate to change a quantitative result to a qualitative result? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the, the reason is when you run an essay for the first, even a qualitative essay like HIV, for example, where you report out positive and negative. Now, there are quantitative HIV essays also, but simplicity sake, let's say there's a qual essay, qualitative essay. When you run it on a machine, the machine still gives you a value. Machine doesn't say positive or negative because it needs a threshold, right, to be able to say above this is positive, below this is negative. HCG, for example, the pregnancy test has a threshold. Above this, chances are you're pregnant. Before that, you're not. Or less than that, you're not. So there are, there are thresholds for positives and negatives, which means there is a quant value that the machine is going to give you. Then your software, based on the rules, in this case, if it is a qualitative essay or quali quantitative essay, it'll take the numbers, look at the threshold, and de to determine whether you're positive or not, negative. So let's assume the threshold was 100, for instance, and I don't know if it was or not. Is 100. If your result was 105, it'll say positive. If it is less than 100, it will say negative. Software will automatically do that. That rule is in the software. And as a matter of fact, I happen to know, I think, and I'm right, that the MMRV panel, the measles, mums, rubella, varicella, I think is the fourth one, they're all qual assays. They are reported out as qualitative values. They're not reported out as quant in general. Even the CLIA lab are all qual assays, which is why they're reported out as qual assays here, qual results here. Make sense? So did you have any concerns, though, that the machine was generating results that were so different, even if it was maybe over a certain threshold? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, uh, there are two answers to that. First, like I said, this is R&D. So in R&D, if things are a little off initially, that's not a worry. Uh, and these results are tech demonstrations. So you clearly tell the user, do not use these for medical decision making. They're not supposed to, which is why they're tech demonstrations. But the other thing is, it is a not an uncommon thing for the devices in the lab, even FDA clear devices, to spit out significantly different results on two different runs. It happens all the time in the lab. As a matter of fact, if you draw your blood, even in the same instance, if I take two tubes from you, and let's say I run 550 tests on this one and 50 this one, the chances of them matching, all 50 of them, is probably close to zero. I mean, you might as well play the Powerball lottery. Uh, it's that low. I'm wondering, considering that all three of these tests had very disparate results, you know, one was positive and then the next one was negative, and then, um, you know, rubella and measles gave pretty different quantitative results, why wasn't the recommendation to just get a redraw from uh, the person who pro provided the sample? Uh, first of all, because it's a demonstration, the point was we can run a test from finger stick, uh, would be the, my first answer. The second would be, Again, I was not in this demo, but whoever was communicating with this person may have said, let's do a redraw, if they were suspicious. Now, it, that's a common protocol also, by the way. If this was not a tech demonstration, if this were CLIA, for instance, the lab director would have said, 
uh, they're actually, there's, I'm going to mispronounce this word, I think it's unequivocal word, they, uh, equivocal. equivocal, yeah, sorry, I can never pronounce it. Unequivocal is the word he's saying. Sorry. Um, and there's a term like that in the lab, where you have positive and negative, but you're not sure, there's some threshold, this is actually is an official result you report out to the doctor saying, uh, we don't know, uh, please do a redraw. So in CLIA lab, that's, that happens quite a bit. But in R&D, that's obviously not a necessity. You, you can put those aside, thank you. I was beginning to memorize these. I'll hand you what's been previously marked as Exhibit 215. Thank you. For the record, 215 is a document that's been previously <coughs> marked as uh, an speed stamp TS0902539. Okay. Do you recognize exhibit um, <coughs> 215? Yes. This is an email conversation between myself and several of the people at Theranos, and finally, the last one is between me and Sones. Uh, the, uh, I want to start with the email that uh, sort of starts at the bottom of the first page and carries on to the, the next page. It looks like a, a, an email from it. See that? Yes. I guess, what positions did all these people have at the t at, at, as of this time in, in June 2013? Sorry, can you point me at the, uh, again? Just the, the one at the bottom of the page, uh, dated uh, timestamp 647. Yeah. Yes, I see that. So, uh, what about Melissa's role? It's the same as Yes. Uh, you mean missed? Yes. The, um, it, it looks like uh, the, the first line after he says, hi all, is for tomorrow's demo, as listed below, we'd like to, we'd like to have a mini lab and either a 4S or mono bay with the Norm Normandy shell uploaded, whichever works better. Yes. Um, wh do, do you know what he's referring to when he says mini lab here based on the context? Um. You know, it, it was a code name for one of the versions of the machine, so I'm assuming he's referring to either 4.0 or 4. What some variation of that? Uh, okay, is this, you think a four series? Yes. What, what, what's your basis for thinking it's a four series? Uh, because those are the machines we had. I mean, if it, if it was 3.x machines, he will call it out as 3.5 or 3.0. Uh, basically, everything else was in the four series. Okay. Um, and do you know what he's referring to when he says mono bay? Yeah, that's the blade that I had mentioned to you earlier. That's what he's referring to. What, 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 what about the Normandy shell uploaded? What is the Normandy shell? Yeah, that's a, a software program that I had written. I had written. Uh, and the easiest way to explain that is, you know, you have an operating system. And if you, in an operating system, if you go to command line, if you say, say command, it shows you a DOS window. I don't know if you've done that. But it's basically a way to interact with the, uh, so some people have done it. It's a way to interact with the, you know what DOS is? Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I'm not going to answer questions oh, sorry. in general. I don't mean to be rude, it's yeah. just the. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. <laughs> I, I, am, I am familiar with it generally, but I, I okay. can, I'm just trying to understand what yeah, yeah, the, my what the shell is here. B basically, it's an equivalent of a command line interface to our machine. And you can go and type commands there, and machine will do those for you. So it, it, just like you have a user interface, and you can click icons and beautiful icons you can flip through and this and that. Or if you are a programmer who just wants to say, get out of my way, I'm going to talk to the machine directly, you just double click on the Normandy shell and it pops up a window and you just directly, directly type raw commands into the shell and the machine can do things for you. Okay, so the shell doesn't refer to sort of the, uh, the operating system for uh, the, that, that sort of nice looking operating system for lack of a better word. Well, it, it does have a nice UI, just like Mac today uh, has this app called Terminal, uh, and it brings you a bl you know green or black window, and you can do Unix commands in it. It's like that. It, and and actually, maybe I should take a step back. Our TSPUs, uh, when I came to the company, I had uh, modified the design very significantly. I wrote a lot of the initial code, and I had pushed our 3.0s used to run Unix, uh, and everything was Linux. I pushed that down, and I put Windows on top of it. So programmers can program everything easily. The UI is easy. We can do 
Bluetooth connectivity with you know third-party devices, you can print stuff, everything you can do from Windows. It was a version of Windows called Embedded Systems, Embedded Windows. And it had a command line interface to be able to talk to Windows and talk to the machine. And so what would be the use of having a um, th that sort of capability for a TSPU for a demo? Uh, again, this is 2013, uh, but even forever, when you are in the demonstration mode and you have a machine that is R&D machine, uh, when you install it, especially if it is my presentation, I wanted to make sure everything is good. So the software developers will stay as long as I had to, so that even after they have tested everything, they will come to the room where the demo is going to happen, and they will go to the command line and run a whole bunch of commands to make sure machine is happy and healthy. And, and Shell allowed them to do everything quickly uh, versus going through GUI, you know, clicking. Normal people like clicking hyperlinks easier. Programmers like to do command line, and hence the word Shell, Normandy Shell. Okay. Uh, I wrote the most of the code, which is why I know. The, the next email up says, um, uh, is, is from Michael, that, that programmer you mentioned, is that right? Yes. And, and he says, FYI, um, I've just finished getting the device OS installed with the Normandy app and properly running the null protocol on mobile labs 4 and 8. Yes. you see that? I do. So device OS installed with the Normandy app, what is that a reference to? Device OS is the Windows 7 embedded system installed. Uh, what, what's the null protocol? Uh, so that's another thing that I wrote. Uh, and it's um, the concept comes from software. Uh, in the world of software, uh, there's a con concept of null, which refers uh, to nothingness, like uh, n uh, like no instructions, don't do anything. Uh, and uh, uh, in databases, for example, if you have a bank account and if you say somebody has zero dollars, that it still implies that you know this person has zero dollars. But if you don't know, you just said null. It means I have no idea. It's, it's undefined. So in software world, this is a common concept. I brought this uh, concept to the world of medical devices. This basically, me, what this protocol did was, um, so our device had uh, this beautiful nine-inch iPad-like interface. Uh, literally a tablet, touch screen, you know, and it was cool because you could be wearing gloves and still be able to touch it, which iPad, you cannot do. Most of the devices you can do. Uh, and because the machine was going to run in the lab. Uh, a lot of the times we would do demonstration uh, for people who would come visit us and we will show them the capability uh, of the device beyond just processing samples. Uh, because our device had Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, we actually also had a prototype of our device with a camera on top of it so you can do tele video conferencing. So the idea was uh, to be able to demonstrate everything without run, having to run the blood test. So you could still go through the entire process. You collect the sample, you put the cartridge. Now, in, mo in this, most cases, we would not collect the sample. We would just insert the cartridge. But when you insert the cartridge, machine still has to initialize as if it's doing something. And, but if you have null protocol, it's not going to do anything. It'll just open the uh, mouth, you put the cartridge like a VHS tape, uh, like a DVD, and uh, <laughs> and um, uh, it will just insert the tape and it will sit on it and not do anything. But now, the screen basically gives you the power to be able to collect more information. So one of the use cases would be was, uh, for example, Ebola you know, uh, assay. If you're running Ebola, it's not enough to just collect the sample. You want to collect more information from the patient. And usually what happens in the field is, the lab is not involved because then somebody else is going to collect on an app or on a piece of paper, and the information can you know, not get to the decision maker. In our case, because we were running full-blown Windows, literally Windows 7, you could uh, tie it to a Bluetooth uh, blood pressure monitor, thermometer, uh, height you know, um, uh, meters, but also on the iPad, the, the touch screen, we were running these iPad-like apps. So what is your first name? What's your last name? Uh, we can even take images of the people if you wanted to. And we can ask them questions. Is there anybody else in your home that's sick? Right? So yes, no will basically triage the, the, the disease. So there were, and that's just one example. There were a lot of apps that we had written that we would run on the device without having to run the blood test. And the point was, am I going OK? Yeah. Uh, the point was to demonstrate the future capability of the device when we start putting this in the field, even just in Walgreens stores. Because one of the challenges in healthcare today is the information about uh, the patient doesn't get to the insurance companies. And by collecting blood and blood pressure and other biometrics as part of one electronic transaction, seems like a simple thing, but in healthcare, this is a huge thing. 
uh, to be able to deliver that information to the insurance company so they can do something about it in real time uh, was a big deal. So that's what Null Protocol demonstrated. And, and so you mentioned the sort of what utility the Null Protocol would have in, in de demonstrations. Was there ever an instance where you collected a sample, um, inserted it to a TSPU using the Null Protocol, uh, but then actually tested the sample at a later point, uh, either in that TSP or in another device? Well, no, not at a later point. If we, for example, were demonstrating the capability of the device and also that, okay, we're going to run a sample on you, the chances are those are two different demos. Uh, because either we are doing you know, a broad panel of tests or whatever you know, we were trying to demonstrate and we will run it in the CLIA lab or an R&D, if we ran it on the machine, then you will see it and the machine will make noises. I mean, you will be able to see that it's running on the machine. So, uh, no, I mean, there will be no need if you are just demonstrating the null protocol to be able to also run the sample, because if you're running the sample, then you're not running null protocol anymore. I, I don't know. Make sense? Yeah. I, think I, I think I follow. So, did the null protocol have any other names at the company? Was it called the demo app? Yes. I mean, it, but actually, demo app was a broader app than null protocol. Demo app would be, uh, you know, let me collect patient information also, right? So anything that you can do at a Walgreens store, which required currently a separate computer, you can put a demo app. and. There could be many different demo apps, but yes, that would be. But in all likelihood, null protocol will be a subset of the demo app if you're just doing a demo app demonstration. So I, I guess I'm trying to understand the context of this message. The, the, the next message up, it says, given ML doesn't have Cyto, uh, what are we planning on running on ML? And then replies, right now we are not planning on running anything on ML, unfortunately. Yes. So does, it appear, does it appear as if uh, for this demo, you're actually the goal is to actually run a blood sample. Uh, in this case, seems like we were going to run blood sample on one of the machines because if you see, I was asking them to put different machines. So, if I was going to do a demo, I probably would have picked a machine and run some blood sample. Okay, so so what you're saying is the null protocol here in this chain refers to samples that the the TSPUs that weren't going to be used to demo the sample. Yeah, no, the that's right. But however, there is also uh, just because a machine can run null protocol doesn't mean you cannot do anything else with it. So if you load a null protocol on the machine, I could insert a blank cartridge and it will know, ah, null protocol. But if I insert a real cartridge on it, it would just run that protocol because a machine can run literally hundreds of thousands of protocols. There's no limitation. Okay, so the, in, in other words, the null protocol wasn't something that would shut down the other functionality. No, it won't. Uh, the null protocol had... It, you had to invoke the null protocol by either the demo app or these decision support apps or questionnaire apps or whatever you, you know, we call them different names, but uh, you will particularly p uh, trigger by, you know, picking some software function. And then it'll say, or there were some cartridges that were mapped to a null protocol. So if a cartridge had 0000, zero, zero, zero I'm just making it up, for instance, uh, then the system will say, ah, that's null protocol, that means don't do anything. The, uh, it looks like at the, at the end of this chain, you forward it on to Ms. Holmes, is that right? Yes. Did you ever discuss the null protocol with Ms. Holmes? Uh, no, this is a <laughs> the deep software concept that I don't think most people in the company, besides the programmers or the people who are working on it, would, uh, would refer to it as null protocol. Hey, Everybody, sorry. Please. Everybody else would probably call it the demo app, or uh, I'm not going to run the, um, the test. I will only demo the app device. Something more user friendly. Uh, was was Miss Holmes familiar with the process for demonstrations where you could insert a cartridge and not have the TSPU actually run uh, the sample? I would say so. Yes. I mean, it, she saw that once or twice. I don't know if she remembers it because a lot of times I wasn't the person in the room. I mean, before we had actually null protocol. Uh, the reason I came I came up with null protocol is because before this. Anytime we had to demo, the machine had to run something. And then I had to volunteer, if nobody else did, to prick my own finger and, and run the sample, because without that, the machine won't proceed. And so it literally, I, would, I was like the blood bank. You know, I was giving samples to them for every demo. And so I said, well, I need another protocol so I can run it without running a sample. Was the null protocol ever created because, yeah, in that process of having to you know, run actual samples of the machine, uh, the machine would come up sometimes with error messages and the, the the sample would sort of stall in place? That's certainly possible. In R&D, machines give you error messages all the time. And in this example, like before 2013, like I said, 
uh, you know, if I ran my sample and something went wrong, the machine will stop. But that was no big deal. This is an R&D machine. I mean, even if the machine catches fire, who cares? You just run another machine. I mean, technology companies' demos fail all the time, so I, that was not a concern for me. The, um, you, you mentioned you'd have to prick yourself. Did you, I mean, did you become proficient at, uh, at drawing blood from a finger? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you want to try it out, I can do it for you. In these demonstrations, would you be the person uh, who would draw the blood from the, uh, from the recipient? No, if, if somebody else volunteered, then when I would have somebody more professional, like a phlebotomist or at least somebody better looking, uh, <laughs> to do the, the blood. But usually I um, did that on myself. So, yeah. I mean, when I was doing a test on myself, I didn't, didn't need a phlebotomist. I could just do it myself. So looking back at um, Exhibit 215 and your email, or sorry, in its email to you at 10.39 p.m., Yes. Um, he says we're not running any, we're not planning on running anything on the ML. Unfortunately, an ML is mini lab. Is Correct. that right? Yes. Uh, and he goes on to say the general chemistry and ELISA assays are not performing adequately for a memo at the at the moment. Was that consistent with your understanding that the mini lab or the four series TSPU um, wasn't running the general chemistry and ELISA, or couldn't run the general chemistry and ELISA assays? Well, no. This is referring to, like I said, he's. This is a specific code name for a specific type of machine, uh, m not necessarily all four series devices. Uh, and again, he's talking about it's not performing adequately for a demo at the moment. What happened was, a lot of times we'd have machines come and go. So machines will come, let's say we have 30 machines, and uh, somebody will think about a good modification in either software, hardware, some tweaking here and there, and without me being informed or other people being informed, uh, most likely would just take the machines and try to you know, repair the, all of them at the same time. And now we would have no machines left uh, to demo or do anything with. Uh, so that's what usually happens. So when he's referring to his, his we are not planning running anything ML. Unfortunately, the GC and ISA assays are not perf Sorry. The GC. Unfortunately. Uh, the general chemistry in ELISA assays are not performing adequately for a demo at the moment. He's talking about just for that moment and most likely for one or two devices that he had access to. Sorry. And so when you're writing back to Ms. Holmes and you're saying very frustrating, it, you're frustrated because the one or two uh, mini labs are, are not working properly? Yeah, it's frustrating because, um, again, this is 2013, so this is fairly early. We were still a small company. I had always wanted a certain setup ready for me to be able to demo any time I wanted. And uh, the R&D guys were R&D guys. They would just take my machines away. Sometimes they will come to my office and take my machines away. And, uh, and that used to frustrate me. So I actually used to literally hide machines in my office and lock my office before I went home. Uh, but people would still find a way to take them. Uh, are you think people would find their way past your locked door or just go in when you when it was unlocked? Or? Probably both. Uh, I, did you ever raise any concerns with people entering your locked office? No, I mean, th these guys were working hard. I, I didn't want to be any hard on. I mean, they were doing the right things. It's just that sometimes I would have preferred to keep my machines because I was coding also. So it was not a c concern for me. It's just that it was a frustration that we didn't have enough people, enough processes, enough devices. And most, like I said, most of the times if I had a device in my office means I'm working on it, I'm writing code. Not like using it, but I have the whole thing open and I'm writing code on it. I'm going to hand you another document that's been previously marked as Exhibit 202. Do you recognize Exhibit 202? Yeah, this is an email from to myself and Elizabeth. And, then it looks, and it looks like the um, email Ms. Holmes responds, is that, is that right? Yes. Um, and this is in the August 2013 time frame. Correct, yes. W what was happening with uh, Theranos' relationship with Walgreens in that August 2013 time frame? Uh, I mean, it was good. We were moving along and marching for a launch at Walgreens in fall, September, October, November timeframe. 
And so to your understanding, when did, when did Walgreens sort of settle and Theranos and Walgreens mutually agree upon a launch date? Uh, I think it happened during, sometimes during 2013. I don't remember exactly when. Uh, but it was in 2013, I think around March, we started doing some dry runs in Arizona. And uh, we decided that when we are ready, we will launch and we'll pick a date. I don't remember exactly when and how we picked uh, the launch date. And actually, if I may add, even when we did quote unquote launch in September, it was only at one store and we were not seeing patients for, for another month or so. We were just inviting friends and family to get the processes and workflow sorted. Uh, so so uh, what you're saying is that September 9th launch was sort of a soft launch? Yeah, we used to actually call it soft launch. Okay. And, and then at some point later in time, it, it opened up for more broadly for actual patient testing. Correct. Right? I think around November, we opened more two more stores in Arizona, and that basically became, quote unquote, the launch. Now we had three stores. The um, email to you and Ms. Holmes <coughs> um, references a number of devices being play, placed in um, it says the following devices are planned to be in the demo interview room. What, what room is that? Is that is that, that sort of mock-up Walgreens space room that you described or something else? No, this is a small room adjacent to our conference room. We had a large conference room like this. And right next to the conference room, there was another door to a small room, which we usually use for interviews. Uh, but sometimes when the conference room was full, we would overflow stuff in there. And we, would, we also use that as a break room, just like you guys have given us a break room here. So if the visitors want to use their small room, they can use that room. And what's he, what's he asking about what he should set up? Uh, let me just see. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll be, we'll be prepared to collect the sample demo interview. Oh, sorry. I think there's one question he's asking, question number five. Is that what you're referring to? Correct. Uh, we had an H1N1 demo uh, app, I think, we had loaded, we had created that allowed us to, the example that I gave you where you're collecting demographic data but not running anything because you're not running H1N1 in your conference room. Uh, but I think this is what he's referring to. I guess, can you, can you walk me through why, It'd be helpful to have so many different versions of a um, of, of Theranos' processing units uh, in a room for a demonstration. Yeah, this this would be a fairly typical normal thing because most of the times when Elizabeth and my uh, myself were in a meeting, we were talking about our future vision or strategy. So we would bring out you know the three or four devices that we are currently working on, and uh, and and show them. Look, these are the capabilities of this one. This is 4.0. It can do this, but it cannot do this. But here's 4.s. It will be able to do this. And then in the future, we can do X, Y, Z. And that will trigger a discussion around, you know, what else should we have in the device? For example, this idea of the camera that I talk about, it came from one such discussion. That would it be useful if we can have a camera on the device? I initially thought the camera will be useful for the lab director to talk to somebody in the field. Like one at some point when we have a unit in field at uh, Walgreens, if a phlebotomist has a question, they can just video conference lab director. Uh, but uh, other people who, vi who visited us said, why don't you think about telemedicine? Because telemedicine was heating up in 2012 and 13. We were already thinking about telemedicine, but to use the camera on the device was, as part of those discussions, this came about. I, I, I'm trying to understand number four here, which says that um, the sentence ends, uh, it says, note that this will not be able to run the null protocol due to old pipette nozzles that fall once they initialize in the protocol. Yeah. I guess, I, I, based on your description of what the null protocol was designed to do, I'm trying to understand how a pipette nozzle could, could yes, fail on that. That's process. a good question. Yeah. So I'm going to go a little bit more in detail on, in code in, on this one. What happened was, I told you, uh, I mentioned earlier that we had three different, when I came to the company, everything was being running, uh, running using Linux, and then we had a third operating system in the device called RTOS, real-time operating system. So by this time, we had three different operating systems in the device. That means three different groups of people were writing different apps. Anytime you initialize the device, each group wanted to do their own thing in the device to make sure the device is okay. 
right? So the software guys at the top, the Windows tier, would uh, you know make sure the cartridge is properly aligned, and they will do a few things. The tier below that, which is the embedded software system I have referred to, in the code they had their own system check. So when you open before you open the door or you close the door, they will send a command to the whole system to say check yourself, make sure everything's okay. And as part of that check, the pipette will check itself. Now they're not supposed to do anything, uh, but again this is R and D, and we were still writing code, and I was bringing the seamlessness of the software still wasn't in place. So what happened was we would issue a reset command, c command, every stack would reset itself, and some of the old code that was responsible for resetting the hardware, pipette, would also try to do something with the hardware, with the pipette, and that's what is happening here. And it would, apparently in this case, is what I read is, due to old pipette, which makes sense, that means it's the old code, nozzles that once fail once, they initialize in the protocol. So that's what is happening. The um, in connection with any demonstrations, did um, did you ever instruct anyone at Theranos to move a large number of its TSPUs to the CLIA lab? Well, TSPUs were always in the CLIA lab uh, or for most of the times. So if we moved the TSPUs there, it probably was to demonstrate something that we were trying to get across, rather than just draw pictures. If we, TSPUs are really easy to move. You can put 50 of them on this table and move them around. And unlike other devices where if you move them from one room, commercial devices, if you move them from one room to another room, you have to call the vendor and they have to calibrate things. TSPUs, we actually got clear waiver on this thing. You can kick it and throw it from the stairs and they will chug along. So if we move them, it was easy to move them, there was probably a purpose behind it. I guess I had understood your your testimony earlier to suggest that the that the that there was sort of a that there was sort of a space within the CLIA lab that was designated for for TSPU use, right? Yes, inside the Normandy room, correct? In, in the, the Normandy room, and the Normandy room didn't run any four series devices, right? Uh, no, it did not. And, 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 and in fact, no four series device was ever used in the CLIA setting, right? Not in the CLIA setting, but I do believe four series devices were taken inside the Normandy lab uh, for R&D purposes. It's not exclusive use. Like I said earlier, if you have anything in the, we were doing product development in the CLIA lab too, which is why R&D guys were going there. But if you have anything in the CLIA lab that is not being used for patient samples, you just need to put a sign on it saying not being used for patient samples. So. Uh, yes, they will be. As a matter of fact, uh, the FDA filing that we did for HSV-1 or even, I think, for the Zika and other tests, uh, the, the 4X devices would be in CLIA lab in some cases, yes. And, and did you ever instruct anyone to put additional 4X devices for a Walgreens tour of the CLIA lab? I don't think I gave a Walgreens, CLIA lab tour to Walgreens. It may have been some other lab. I doubt I gave for uh, the CLIA lab tour to Walgreens. Which time frame was it? I, I'm just asking oh, probably. Sorry, sorry, not supposed to ask you questions. Um, I, I don't recall uh, uh, the tour. As a rule, I would have not given tour to Walgreens for the CLIA lab unless it was really early in our process uh, where the CLIA lab was light. But even then, I don't think we took them to CLIA lab. What is BDT Capital? Um, it's a, and I actually don't know what their full business is, but it's a financial, our relationship with them was they were a consulting company. We had hired them as a cons financial consultants to help me and Elizabeth with thinking through a uh, few things about the company's future. At, at some point in time, do they also become a potential investor, Theranos? They had uh, a great interest in investing, and they, you know, mentioned very large amounts, uh, but we didn't have any interest in them investing. Uh, we didn't think they were strategic investors. But they had uh, mentioned 600 million or more uh, as part of a deal. They wanted to do some kind of structure deal, and we had no need to do that. Uh, but they had great interest in investing, but we, we had not, we didn't have any interest. So from your perspective, at any, at any point in time, you were, uh, in 2014, uh, you didn't have any interest in, in receiving funds from BDT Capital? No, I'm sure initially or at some points when we engaged with them, we did have a conversation with them of them being potential investors. 
which is why um, um, you know the whole conversation about uh, the, the ability to reach a decision that we don't want them as investors uh, but I don't think that lasted for too long and initially I think right off the bat they were talking about structured deals and you know, financial instruments and we were a conservative company we didn't want to necessarily do that uh, d did you meet with representatives from BDT in the, in that 2014 time period? Yes, I did. Uh, uh, we had, like I said, engaged them as consultants. They helped me a lot with my uh, business planning tool, the model that we talked about earlier. Uh, who do you remember meeting with from BDT? Uh, I think the the principal of BDT's name is Byron Trott. Uh, I met with him two or three times, uh, and um, there were two other people from his company, or maybe three, who had attended those meetings. Uh, I don't remember the names, unfortunately. But I, I remember meeting them, and it was their principals, or these uh, associates, who had helped me with the financial model. We sat in a conference room, went through the financial model, the assumptions, and them, them advising me. I'll, I'll hand you has been previously marked as Exhibit 203. Do you recognize Exhibit 203? Um, yes, it's an email exchange between, uh, I think, Christian Holmes and myself and Elizabeth Holmes. Uh, do you recall making arrangements for uh, members of the BDT team to receive a demonstration at a Walgreens? I personally don't recall uh, because I was not uh, involved with you know, managing who was doing, getting what demo, but I was not personally involved. I don't recall. Uh, who, who who would be managing, who would be getting the demos? I think it, if somebody wanted to get a demonstration, it may have come up in the meeting saying, hey, can we get a demo? And we would have said, what do you want to do? Or we want to do finger stick or whatever they want to see. And we say, yeah, uh, would usually be available in the conference room for any follow-up action items. And we'll say, okay, work with them, they will get it done. The, um, uh, for, for demonstrations done at, at, at the Walgreens setting, that would that, that'd be under the CLIA framework. Right. Yes. And uh, if someone if someone wanted a just a demonstration of the finger stick technology, they didn't necessarily need to go to a Walgreens, right? They could do that at at Theranos headquarters. Technically speaking, yes. Actually, let me qualify my first answer. It is possible for somebody to have asked for a demonstration of the process of the Walgreens uh, process, like how do you check in, how what does a patient go through. But it is possible that on the back end, we would add on tests that were not in the CLIA, then it no, no longer would be a CLIA demonstration. So we are still demonstrating to them our workflow in Walgreens, what our setup looks like, how our rooms look like, how our patient uh, sample collection process looks like. All of that, so, uh, most of that could be done at Theranos at quarter, but not, obviously not all of it. Uh, but it, it would, wouldn't necessarily be CLIA. I misspoke earlier, so I just want to correct that. In California, was it your understanding that you could Add tests onto a, a doctor's order, and um, for 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 someone trying to get a demonstration in California. Yeah, for demo, as long as you're not going through CLIA lab, no problems. My point I'm, I was making just just to clarify is there's a distinction between the what you do through the lab and what you're doing at a PSC uh, or patient service center or collection site. People can go to the patient uh, collection site, and we can do clinical studies there. We can do R and D samples there. That's not an issue. The only point I was making is if the sample is collected for CLIA processing and if it goes to CLIA, then if you're going to add on a test, the request has to come from a, a authorized party like a physician. So physicians, of course, can add tests. As, as a general rule, if a physician requested the test, and uh, would, that, would that fall under the CLIA framework? Yes. Okay. So if you take a look uh, at the... Uh, sorry, unless... Either the physician or the patient has overridden that, saying, uh, "Yeah, I have a lab order. I want to do these tests, but uh, you know, but these are the tests I'm interested in. But results may or may not go to the physician. The, the patient could could override dropping tests also." 
Uh, so, just so I understand, a patient couldn't add tests to its doctor's order for, for, a, for, a, for a CLIA lab run. Correct. But it could drop tests for a CLIA lab run? Yes, yes. Okay. And, and the distinction you made there was that if they drop tests, it wouldn't go to the physician? No, that was a separate point. Okay. If the, in our case, for example, if somebody wants to just see the process, how it works, then they can still bring a, you can, you can bring a lab order from your physician and say, I would like to demo. And in that case, we can do all those tests, put our physician's name on it, and the results will not go to your doctor. Or if it is just a pure tech demo, then we are just using the lab order just to transcribe what tests you want to get done. But then it's n n neither our doctor or your doctor is involved. It's just pure demo. Make sense? Then it, but then in that case, it's not clear anymore. So, so if you take a look at the, the workflow is proposing here, um, the, the, actually, why, why don't we get started earlier in the chain? Uh, it looks like it starts out with asking uh, the, the names of the, of the people mentioned yes. to who would come, who would visit uh, WAG on Saturday. Did you understand that to be the WAG Patient Service Center in Palo Alto? And, yes. Um, and then it looks like you follow up and you ask to, to send the uh, list of names? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, um, and then it looks like he, um, he follows up with, uh, he starts out, by saying, starts out by saying, also wanted to send along our thoughts for how to accomplish the FS in the scenario their orders prompt Venus. Assumptions here from EAH are that we must not do Venus draw and we cannot tell them that their order prompts Venus if it does. Do you see that? Yes. Um, wh what do you understand this to mean? Well, um, I think w uh, what we do is, he's already spoken with uh, Elizabeth at this point that they want the patient to only get finger stick. And uh, it's probably because they had already spoken that they, they want to experience finger stick. In this case, um, I mean, I would have described the process differently and, and the way uh, that's done here, but uh, software takes care of a lot of details here automatically. A lot of the details that he's putting here are automated in software. He didn't have to you know, define what is happening in the software. But what he's saying here is, if my understanding is, that if a vena puncture happens, we have already decided we are doing finger stick. Right? That basically means one of the two things happened, at least two things happened. One is either there's a test that triggers vena puncture happened, or the combination of all those tests triggers vena puncture. That's what happened. And he's a sorry, sorry to interrupt. Just fr from the order, right? The order could be is, correct. Is the is the uh, data point that that triggers it one way or the other? Correct. Yes. So what happened used to happen in our case was when you bring a lab order, we had built this beautiful system where you will scan the lab order, it goes to the cloud, and the machine learning algorithms will do image analysis and try to transcribe it, so humans don't have to do it. And if it is not accurate, then the humans can click, 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 and override it. Right? But hum in cases where we know that it's triggering a vena puncture. There's nothing you can do. The order goes back to the technician and the Walgreens, and Walgreens will just basically say, sorry, it's vena puncture. Right? It will not be able to override and say, I'm going to drop some test. Tell me which test you want to drop. It was not part of the workflow at this point yet. So it looks like um, scenario one yes. uh, involves use case A. Um, and it says, one, one option, use case A, the bullet point below says, remove tests that are not yet on FS and complete transcription. So is that basically suggesting drop some tests from the order um, and then proceed with a finger stick? Correct. And what he's trying to do is basically try to automate this interaction that this person would have had with Walgreens technician. I mean, the, the net result of all of this is this is what he was trying to avoid the interaction this person is going to have with the Walgreens technician. Because if this person says, hey, how come you didn't do that test? Walgreens techs usually were not trained, and they had no idea, by the way, uh, what, to, what was the answer. They will just say, ah, oh, that's the way it is, or I can just do vena puncture. By default, it will do vena puncture. But if we want to override that, somebody on the back end had to override that, is what he was trying to do. Um, and it looks like, so, so use case B is sort of another s scenario that's set up in order to, to, to allow the test to proceed by finger stick. Do you yes. see that? Yes, I do. And, and it looks like the, the, the negatives, the, the second bullet point yes. says, um, if they notice missing tests on the receipt, they may ask the WAG tech about it. 
worst case, they would make a call to CS. What's CS? Call center. And uh, Anam would tell them everything is fine. She's the one of the people in the call center. And CR will also be able to come out of the drawer room once check-in is complete to welcome them into the room and distract from looking at the receipt. Yeah, this is really uh, stupid. I, I didn't. I, I wish I'd read that at that point. Uh, and but I don't condone this. What he was trying to do was, in order to avoid the negative interaction that this guest was going to have with the Walgreens technician, create this so that the technician, at least at the Walgreens, doesn't have that interaction. Now, it will be impossible for this patient to n not know which tests were not done. The reason is, it's in the software. When you print a receipt, the receipt shows you what tests were done and what were not done. Because even if you send it the uh, order to insurance company, that's the part, part that I think he's missing is, they will be printed on the receipt. There's no way around it. And the second thing is when you send the results back, if something is not done, it's not there. You will be able to tell that the test was not done. I think what he was trying to do here is avoid this person having that interaction with the Walgreens technician because this is the only thing you can accomplish here. Like I said, it's impossible to hide from the patient what tests were not done or what were done. Uh, now, I don't think this actually happened, by the way. I didn't pay attention to this email then, but I don't think this was actually ever carried out, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, how do you know? Uh, I would have heard about it. I mean, if uh, something like this, where somebody's violating the SOPs, I was always a stickler to that, that I would, I would like to find out if something is happening. I mean, a cynical person could read this and, and think that what he's trying to do here is hide the fact that Theranos does Venus draws. Yeah, which from, is from the BDT folks here. Yeah, which is the stupid part because Venus draws are a known fact. If I mean, a lot of our uh, investors actually did go to Walgreens, did get a vena puncture. It's a common practice that we did. It actually, actually, you could call our call center and say, "This is my lab order. Is it going to be finger stick or vena puncture?" And we will say, "It's going to be vena puncture." So it's a well-known, common information, and in this case. The invest, this person, actually not an investor, I mean consultant, would already would find out what, that some tests were dropped and... If, if they read their sort of blood order in, in detail, is that yeah. right? And most of the times when you're doing a demonstration, people did read it. Uh, and if there was something missing, people would say something is missing. But this is a poor way of trying to accomplish that outcome, in my opinion, a very poor way. Did you participate in this conversation that, that appears to be referenced between um, uh, the sort of per EAH uh, assumptions here from EAH. You, you said earlier that you, you imagine there was some conversation between Ms. Holmes uh, about this. Uh, so See, I mean, this is what it alludes to, that so yeah. somehow this information was uh, requested that make sure they get, they get to experience finger stick. Uh, but I unfortunately didn't read that email back then. Like I said, uh, this was not necessarily a very uh, important customer for me. Uh, so I didn't necessarily pay attention. I wish I had because I would have probably responded to this. But yeah. But I was not part of the conversation at that time. Okay, so you don't recall a conversation where Ms. Holmes gave the instruction uh, the, 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 that he alludes to here? Correct. No, I don't. D did you ever hear Ms. Holmes give the instruction that demonstrations, certain demonstrations should only be conducted by a finger stick? Yeah, I, I did that too. I mean, a lot of times when the customer says, I want to experience your finger stick at Walgreens, uh, and in some cases we will just create the order ourselves electronically. So we will just go and create an order saying, your order is ready, just show up and you'll be able to see it. But if the patient says, no, no, I'm going to bring my lab order, then they will bring the lab order and I will say, if you want to do finger stick, then here's the process. These are the tests we will not be able to do. And we will still set the patient up uh, this way. But a lot of times people just went on their own. I mean, that's the whole point of being in Walgreens. There's uh, uh, a few, few people from PFM also went there, uh, the hedge fund, and, and got a test done. And it was actually one guy, he sent them an email saying, I went there. It was a vena puncture, but I got a stuck with the needle, uh, and but the entire process was really cool. Uh, so people did that all the time. Uh, other than the PFM, do you remember the name of the PFM person who? who uh, yeah, I think his name was Brian Healy. Uh, is, is my recollection, but I could be wrong. Do, do you remember any other investors or prospective investors who uh, sort of reported getting the vena puncture? I don't know, but I, I, uh, I mean, I, I, first of all, it's in the database, so I would not know. But I know there were people who uh, would go to Walgreens to get a lab test done. I guess if, if someone's coming for just, you know just to experience the finger stick, um, 
and they're. Um, I, I'm still trying to understand if, if the value of the demonstration is the finger stick, what's the value in going to Walgreens? To see the Walgreens process. That's the point I was going to make is that it's not just finger stick. If it's just the finger stick, you can do it right there in that quarter. Not an issue. In this case, clearly this person wants to experience the whole Walgreens experience. And actually in some cases, or many cases, we used to insist that people go there because the space there was really, really nice. We had built our space the way we wanted lab to look like, you know, with a nice couch, with flowers and TV and fish floating and calming people down with the calming Zen music. Uh, so we, we did want people to go and see a completely different experience. And uh, the other, uh, obviously, big value was software. Because once you go there, uh, if you go to Quest Diagnostics or LabCorp or other hospital labs, as I'm sure you already know, you know it takes 30 minutes, an hour, sometimes multiple hours to go through the whole process. Uh, in our case, we had brought it down to 2 minutes to 10 minutes or 12 minutes. So if you are already in our system electronically or if you use our mobile app, we could get you in and out in 2 minutes and, and happen all the time. Uh, we actually had a scenario in which we could get you in and out in 60 seconds. Uh, you can literally park your car. Your iPhone will send us a signal that you're here uh, with your permission. The phlebotomist will arrange everything. We'll put you in the front of the queue because you already made an appointment. You get in and get out. Uh, so we could do that. So there was a tremendous value in software uh, to be able to show people how good we are on the front end. Uh, do, do you know if people from BDT got results from any demonstration tests? I actually don't know. I'll hand you another document that I'll mark as Exhibit 242. At some point, maybe we could take a break, but I don't want to disturb if you're on the same topic. Yeah, yeah maybe just one more document and then take a break. Of course, sir. Um, <coughs> So marking is Exhibit 242, a document date stamped uh, TS-103-1661. Do you recognize Exhibit 242? Uh, actually, if you give me one second, I can read this real quick. Actually, I'm, I'm not on this email until the very end, but it seems like an email discussion between a few product managers and one person from call center, and then finally towards the top, uh, send this to me and Elizabeth. Uh, and, and it looks, it, when he sends it to you on, is that Monday, October 13th at 8.55? Yes. Uh, he says, FYI, this is for the BDT individual for whom we couldn't release CMP, but somehow was released via the app yep. working through this. Yes. Uh, and, and it refers to, um, you know, sort of the normal process by which results would be made available through a CLS, is that right? Correct. Uh, does a CLS, what does that refer to? Clinical lab scientist. Is that someone working in the CLIA lab? Yes. So does this email suge change suggest to you that someone's uh, results were released before they were approved? No, what happened was there was, I remember this, there was a bug in the software and the BDT guys were having a lot of trouble. As a matter of fact, if you chase this cha chain down further, you will see somebody highlighted the bug, which we ultimately fixed. What happened was uh, when a CLS uh, had either released them or not actually had seen the result, but there was another step in which before the results were released to the iPhone user, the end user, somebody had to provide a final oversight. And in this case, when uh, somebody in the lab changed the status of a batch of results, even though it was not released to the physician, it got released to the patient. And uh, that's what happened here. I remember this. And so, so I guess the, the results were re released um, 
if you look at this one, the, the, I think the results were tagged for a redraw. Right, so this is the CLIA, CLIA setting, right? Correct. And so a, a redraw means Theranos shouldn't report a result. Correct. Um, but, but, but somehow a, report, uh, a result was reported to, to this individual. Correct. Right? And because redraw was requested because we didn't have confidence in the results, as this is the case, it's the SOP, uh, that we should have not, these results should not go out. What should go out is invalid results or whatever the language CLIA uses with a recommendation for a redraw recommended. Do, do you know if Theranos followed up with the, this individual from BDT to instruct them to get a redraw? I think so too. Yes, I, I believe so. But I actually, we were thinking about even flying somebody to Chicago uh, for a redraw if he wanted to. Uh, why so, would you do that? Because this guy was from Chicago. No, I, I, I understand, but this is, you describe this BDT as sort of a, an advisor, I guess. Why would it be so important? Because this is the CLIA process we were following. This was not a technology demo from what I remember. This actually went through CLIA lab and as a courtesy, when you say a redraw recommended, we didn't have a phlebotomist in Chicago area at that time. If they came back to our PSCs, no problems. But we thought about it, should we even fly somebody there? No, we didn't. I don't think so we did. But that's why I remember this, because it came to me, uh, my attention at some point. And because this was also a software bug is why it kind of stuck in my head. Did you ever notify um, this person from BDT that the results, um, that you weren't confident in the results that had been released to him? Uh, my guess is yes. Uh, the, that was the normal CLIA SOP. Uh, so that should have happened. That's my expectation. This is the follow on to the next e the email, this one email. I know the software did get fixed because you know, that was my responsibility uh, to chase down the people who uh, released the software in production. But uh, as part of the CLIA uh, SOP would be that we are doing requesting a redraw. Okay. So you think he might have been apprised of it, but you don't know whether I, he was told? I, I, I don't know for sure. I don't remember. But what I would say is I'll be very surprised if it didn't happen. I would say we did correct it. I mean, on his app, he would see redraw requested, and he would be notified that there's a redraw request. The result, don't pay attention to these results, they're inaccurate, and redraw is being requested. If he reopened the app? No, I, well, if you reopen the app, you will not see it. But I think our normal lab protocol was if the results went to his physician, then that would have happened also. Uh, whose responsibility would it have been to, to request the redraw? Oh, we clear lab. Technically, clear lab would do it. But in this case, because we had product managers involved, uh, my guess is some PM probably took on himself to say, "I will make sure that happens." So, so that, that's sort of a related question. What were the, what were the PM's roles in the clear lab space? Yeah. Um, well, the clear lab space had a lot of people uh, roles where you can be assisting. You don't have to be necessarily processing samples. For example, the people who work to check you into a CLIA lab. They have a certain role in CLIA lab. Uh, people checking you at the PSC, at the patient service center. The PM's job was facilitating communication, making things move faster, uh, making sure if the customer is uh, somebody who was in, uh, in a meeting that I attended or Elizabeth attended, that they get the results correctly or in time before I speak with the customers first. So and in CLIA lab, a lot of the samples were processed in batches, as I told you earlier. Uh, but if there's a sample that I wanted processed right away, they would also call the CLS or somebody in the lab saying, I need the sample processed right away. I know the normal process is to wait for eight hours, but of course you can process a sample in CLIA lab any, anytime you want. Uh, but the right person who was trained and authorized can come and process the sample. So this is kind of what they did. Besides um, a thousand other things, but in CLIA lab, this was their main role. Why don't we go off the record at 3.08 p.m.? Off the record. Reopened. Rolling. Uh, we're back on the record at 3.21 p.m. Uh, Mr. Balwani, just confirm you didn't have any substantive conversations with the staff during the break. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, I'm going to hand you a document that's been previously marked as Exhibit 205. Do 
Do you recognize Exhibit 205? I do. What is it? It's an email conversation between myself and uh, Elizabeth is CC'd on some of this communication towards the end. So, um, it looks like on the next, uh, on the second page, THPFM 00003311113. There, there's an email from you on December 29th, 2014 at 9.37 p.m. It says, run, run manually, but needs to be accurate. Yes. What, what are you instructing there? Uh, so, and let me actually give you a background on this one. We had a test called PTPTTT that was originally available in the CLIA lab from Fingerstick. And uh, we removed that test at some point because there was not enough volume which is, again, a very common thing to do in CLIA lab. They are not like iPhone apps. When you install, they can stay there forever. If you have a test in the CLIA lab, then you have to QC it, calibrate it. There's a lot of manual labor that goes on maintaining a test live, quote unquote, in the CLIA lab. So this test had low volume. Even though it was on finger stick, we removed it because the overhead of maintaining this in the lab was too much. Uh, so in this case, uh, we are trying to uh, I think this this customer may have requested PTPTT test. Now, we had it available in our company from Fingerstick. So I asked the team to resurrect it in the R&D environment and run it. Uh, I think I had a comment here that somebody says that, you know, trying to bring it on a uh, the, the TCAN device, the T-Rex that I already mentioned, will be more work. It'll be easier if it's just one sample to do it manually. Manually basically means instead of using a robot, to take, carry out a lot of the steps, a human can do it, which is, again, a common thing in clear lab, and, and no big deal, in R&D for sure. But this is our assay, our reagent that's being used. So in this case, we are using our reagents, our chemist, chemistry, our protocol to run this, but instead of running it automatically, we are running it manually, is what I'm saying. So what I recommended here, ask here is saying, run it manually, but it has to be accurate, means make sure uh, that in, in clear lab, things are not just accurate and inaccurate, uh, there's accuracy precision levels. So, uh, you know, if a, clear, if a test in CLIA lab requires that you have to be within 10% CV, like coefficient of variation, that's acceptable CLIA lab. But if it is 15%, it's off. You're like more than quote unquote accurate according, according CLIA lab standards. So, what I'm saying here is yes, you can run it manually. Obviously, I knew this was not in CLIA lab because I told them to run it even though it's not in the CLIA lab but make sure it's accurate as in it fits into the CLIA lab CV. So uh, I, I guess I'm trying to understand that. So if, if, it's, if it's not being run in the CLIA lab, why would it be important to run it within the CLIA lab CV? Because as a company, we had a lot of technology that's not in CLIA lab that we still want to be able to demonstrate to people. For example, there was a lot of software that we had which was not in production yet, like the mobile app that I talked about, but we used to demonstrate to people a lot of the times even actually install it on people's devices before it was on the App Store. So here what we are saying is, no, we have the capability to run this test. We just don't offer it in the CLIA lab because it no longer you know, had the volume requirements, but we have the technology. And I think I saw here somewhere that Mark, uh, somebody s talked to me and said, Mark, this is a technology the demonstration, uh, which is correct because it's no longer being run in CLIA lab, it's a tech demonstration. And, uh, and that's, that's what we are saying. So there's nothing wrong with showcasing or even showing off of our technology if you can do something that others just cannot do. So if you look at the email right before the one I was just asking about, mm -hmm. where, uh, it's, this is email to you on December 29, 2014 at 7.54 p.m. Mm -hmm. um, he references uh, a bit more complicated than originally planned. For, do you see that? Yes. Do you, do you take that to mean that this is uh, for a demonstration? Uh, seems like it, yes, because like I said, PT and PTTD is not in CLIA lab, so I'm assuming you're asking me whether it's a demonstration or CLIA or is it misformation or not? It? Yes, yes, that's correct. The, the, um, did you explain that, that this was going to be a, um, an R&D test as opposed to a CLIA test? Yes. If he got the results, when he got the results, it would say on top, technology demonstration. The, um, I guess my question is a little different. Did, did you tell him at any point in time that that um, technology demonstration meant R&D lab versus CLIA lab? Uh, I personally didn't, but 
if it is a CLIA lab report, it will say a CLIA lab report signed and sealed by director, uh, lab director. If it is a tech demonstration, it will say tech demonstration clearly on top of the report. So uh, he's a fairly educated guy. If you see something uh, at the top that says tech demonstration, that means tech demonstration. The um, it, it looks like uh, earlier in the ch uh, or later in the chain, so the first page of Exhibit 205, um, there's some, there's some uh, discussion about uh, reporting CL. You see that? Yes. Uh, what is CL? I think it's chloride. Um, and, and, and the question from on December 30th, 2014 at 550 is, should we report with CL pending redraw per usual p protocol, or better in this case to go another route? Do you see that? Yes. And it looks like at the end of the day, um, Ms. Holmes makes the decision, OK, don't include on report. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, I guess why was it appropriate in this case? So you want the you want the test results to be accurate on the CLIA range, right? Why is it appropriate to drop results and um, which would presumably not be following the CLIA protocol? Uh, even uh, actually, I think you showed me an example earlier. Even in R and D, if we don't have confidence in something, uh, we would drop it because you don't want to report wrong results to a patient. Period. Uh, as much as possible, you want to apply and use the protocols that the patients and the doctors are used to seeing. Uh, if you get a typical lab result, if a lab director or the person performing the test has a doubt about the test, they don't just put the result and say, oh, by the way, I'm not so sure about this. You just don't report it just in case somebody relies on the result uh, incorrectly. Because people will say, you know what, I don't want to get a redraw done. This seems good enough, and may rely on it. So it's better and safer anytime you have a doubt uh, not report something. And that's a, a, a fairly well understood and, uh, um, and followed protocol in the lab industry in general. And R&D guys, to the extent possible, should be following. And this time, this is also 2014, end of 2014. So our processes have matured by this time. So even R&D guys, actually, I think even the report, if you look at the R&D reports, were mimicking our CREA lab, lab reports. They, they were not like the rough reports that we saw earlier. I think they were getting better by this time. I guess I'm still trying to understand. So you're trying to mimic the CLIA process as much as possible. Why is Ms. Holmes deciding what should and should not be included on the report? Because this decision is not a lab director decision. This is a technology demonstration. We talked earlier who are the people who could make decisions in R&D. And R&D uh, does not have any SOP or requirements that you know, a person or a VP of R&D has to make a decision. You know. Other people made decisions. Now, there has to, be, has to be a good reason to make a decision, good clinical reasons to make a decision. As you can tell by spending a lot of time with CLIA Lab, I acquired a lot of knowledge of what the SOPs in CLIA Lab are. So, you know, I could probably make some decisions, but obviously in CLIA I'll, I won't. But in R and D, I would say I would be able to make them. So I think same thing you're seeing here. But even if it wasn't a requirement for the lab director to be making decisions on these technology demonstrations, why not let the why not have the lab director review? Because as you said, you want to make sure that the results that are being um, sent to these people are accurate. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be an additional layer. That would be just a good idea. But it was not a requirement. Honestly, we didn't think about that to necessarily include a lab director. There are a lot of qualified people here who are working abroad, a phenomenal background uh, in clinical chemistry. So it's not like we had a la lack of confidence uh, in the people involved making a decision. It was you know, just adding one more person. And I think you can extend the argument by saying, if you have two lab directors, maybe both of them should look at it, right? But it was that we already had enough qualified people who I thought we thought were looking at these results and ultimately did become a lab director in Arizona just two months later. Why was looking at this as opposed to, I mean, you mentioned, you know, why have two lab directors if you already have somebody reviewing it? But why not have, since he is the lab director in Newark, yeah, reviewing because, these reports? Sure. One reason is because he's in Newark. He's a lab director for the CLIA lab. We had, God knows, more than enough work to do in CLIA lab. Uh, so pull lab people in R&D was something that I was not fond of. Uh, that's the one reason. Uh, the other thing is the R&D people could move faster. If something needs to be troubleshooted, they are there. They can pull up the com computer, the, command, the shells, and this and that. All the scripts are available to the R&D guys. Uh, we could just go walk down the... R&D lab and literally talk to the QC person saying, did the QC failure happen or not? So we knew the R&D landscape completely in the clinical lab. He didn't even know majority of the people in R&D. So things would have slowed down if he had added another layer on top of it.
and what was qualifications to make decisions on these lab results? Well, he, he's, a, he's a pretty outstanding guy, and he spent a lot of his time on clinical chemistry and bioinformatics, uh, mapping the pathways in human brains. Uh, I won't be able to describe his qualifications in detail because uh, he did a lot of R&D work around uh, hum uh, genomics and pathways, sorry, human pathways. Uh, he did bioinformatics. Then when he came to Theranos, he spent six or seven years in the clinical lab uh, 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 essay development. He really understood a lot of the nuances of essay development. He brought the right background. Uh, he was already leading the team of people who were doing a ton of data analysis for CLIA Lab. So once you, uh, so for, uh, for essay development, once you develop an essay, all of the raw results have to go to somebody who can do analysis on the data to see how the essay is performing, how the R&D is working. So it requires a lot of machine learning, a lot of software and, um, uh, and algorithm uh, skills responsible for that. They did all the data analysis. He had, I think, 10 or 12 people in his team who were churning data. So as part of the assay systems R&D, he really got deep into the assay development process. Uh, and I think he's as qualified as anybody in that part of the business, in that part of the, uh, the laboratory. Uh, and then also, once he got to the point by this time that he also understood the CLIA lab SOPs pretty well, and once he took the Arizona lab, uh, you know, it just, he, he, he feel, felt like the, same, the right guy uh, for the job. It is very rare and difficult, almost impossible to find people who have the clinical chemistry understanding and also bring the data analysis, machine learning background. It's a very unique skill set that uh, he brought. And my hope was once he has managed the Arizona lab, got more experience, he would have ultimately been qualified to be a high complexity CLIA lab director and put him in role where he can be responsible for all of the labs. You know, uh, We actually were building on a suite of applications that allowed us to apply artificial intelligence on the CLIA lab uh, data in real time. So if he saw a machine in Pennsylvania drift a little bit, before even the CLIA lab knew, our AI would know. Uh, nobody has applied machine learning and artificial intelligence to a clinical lab, in my knowledge, and I don't think anybody will for a long time. We were doing that and had just the perfect background for that. So you mentioned that you know the right thing to do in, in this situation uh, with the chloride result was just to remove it entirely from the report. Why not just you know remove the result, keep chloride on there, but say need free draw? Uh, well, usually when you do R&D samples, you don't put need redraws uh, as a practice. I don't know what ex what happened after this report, so obviously I, I don't want to guess what was communicated to Trot and what he knew, but in R&D world, it's not odd to remove a test that you couldn't perform uh, in some cases. There's nothing, there's nothing unusual about not including a test you just couldn't do in R&D. Based on, what is that based on? What is your understanding based on? This, talking to the R&D um, develop uh, people, uh, you know, just listening to these guys. Uh, so because you're, and also just general common sense that if you're trying to demonstrate to somebody that I can do 14 things, like CHEM 14 is 14 tests. And when you send the results, they are 13, then it's not CHEM 14 anymore. And you don't call it a complete metabolic panel. So some other things are kind of obvious also that if you're expecting 14 and you report 13, then one didn't get performed. When you were asking for the results to be accurate, were you aware whether or not it's going to compare this test result with any other test result? I don't know. Actually, uh, it's not easy to do that in, in laboratories. You can't compare results and say, people make that mistake all the time, and they will say, my vitamin D at UCSA was 50 and at Theranos was 40, so UCSA must be better. The labs use different equipment, different reagent lots, different lot of things. So like I said earlier, it's unlikely that he can compare something and be able to reach a conclusion if necessarily our PT is right or wrong, which is why my emphasis was make sure we know for sure that um, we have done everything right, which means make sure you run the QC properly, don't just take a shortcut because it's an R&D sample. I, did, I guess my question was just, were you aware whether or not he was planning on comparing these results with any others? I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me. I mean, there were people who used to come to our locations and uh, compared to other labs, uh, you know, I mean, doctors told us that. I think it was printed in media also, so it didn't surprise me at all. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me. I don't know. You, you, okay. Yeah, but I wouldn't surprise me. Okay. Yeah. 
You said earlier that um, the fact that the lab reports had technology demonstration at the top would mean that it would have been run in an R&D setting and not in the CLIA lab. It could have run in the CLIA lab also some, on some machines, mm -hmm. but the full purpose of the report was demonstration. And in, in CLIA reports, you can rely on them for medical decision making. The, you could run some of the tests in CLIA lab equipment in the CLIA lab facility, but we are still treating them in R&D. For example, let's say if I was the phlebotomist, I would do your lab a test. Even if everything else happened in the CLIA lab perfectly, according to SOP, because I'm not certified to collect your sample, it would be a dem tech demonstration. Okay, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, when he comes in to get his, his test done, right. why would it be obvious to him that just because his lab reports his you know, technology demonstration at the top that it's being done at the R&D lab and not the CLIA lab, and therefore some of the procedures or SOPs that would be in place at, at the CLIA lab wouldn't apply to his uh, reporting? I, I don't think the issue here is if something says technology demonstration, therefore, must have run in R&D. Mm -hmm. The point here is, like I said earlier, just a few minutes ago, you could have run the entire thing in the CLIA lab, but you may have violated one small SOP. For example, the guy who collected your sample is no longer a CLIA sample. So the, impl the implication here is not necessarily that if it is technology demonstration, therefore it's not in a CLIA lab, it's in R&D. The point is, do not rely on this for medical decision making. Don't take this to your doctor, because doctors will see at the top it's a tech demonstration. Ask me the question again. Maybe I didn't answer it correctly. I think you said before that must have known, or these these VIPs or you know prospective investors or investors must have known that this was being uh, processed in the R and D lab and not the CLIA lab because the report said it was a technology demonstration. I'm just trying to understand why do you think that's obvious yeah. to people? Well, if you said that, I mean, yeah. the record will speak for itself. Yeah, I actually don't know if those are my exact words, but I, I understand your concept. I think the point I was trying to make and the point I just made here is that if some, th some report says technology demonstration, that means if not all of it, it was processed in CLIA lab. Now, it's not obvious to them uh, which part was processed in CLIA lab, which was not. That doesn't have to be. The most important thing is this is not a report from CLIA uh, uh, lab. This is a tech demonstration at the top. Now, is, it, that doesn't mean that somebody who engaged with and explained that to him, I'm not suggesting that, that this was the only way we communicated to it. I just don't know. Well, I'm just responding to what was what is in front of us, which is a report, which is tech demonstration. And the point of that is, this is for demonstration of technology, not for CLIA lab purposes. And that's the only difference. Now, the CLIA, the lab may have, the, sorry, the sample may have run in CLIA lab. Everything may have checked out, except for maybe one minor thing. And that would prompt it to say tech demonstration, not CLIA. Yes. Did, you, did you ever do anything for any of these technology demonstrations to explain to the, to the, to the people who are, who are getting the demos um, that, that, their, that their blood was a tech demonstration as opposed to a CLIA uh, sample? Yeah, I mean, in most cases when we met with people, like I said earlier, we were not demonstrating CLIA lab. Uh, so we would always start by saying we are talking. We will do a demo for you, right? Or we will show you a future X, Y, Z, or something that we wanted to show to them. Uh, it could be a new CTN. It could be a new process, a new software. People, when they came and met with myself or Elizabeth, they didn't come here to say see how we were doing in Walgreens location. They could just go to Walgreens location for that. When people came and engaged with me, I mean, I actually never don't recall any meeting in which I was going to say, oh, I'm going to do exactly what CLIA Lab will do on you so you can see the process. It would be just better to send them to Walgreens. So, I'm sorry. So, so your, your general practice was to, to, to call it a demonstration. Yes. Is that fair? Yeah. But, but not call it out and say, by the way, this isn't going to be processed in our CLIA Lab or isn't going to be processed pursuant to CLIA SOP. Yeah, I mean, I, I never got an inclination from anybody, any investor, who they would, he, would, he would be able to, uh, they, they would ask or cared about that detail. If it is a tech demo, it's a tech demo. We are demonstrating technology. Um, what, what is Madrone Partners? Uh, you can put this document aside. Oh, yeah. uh, actually, I think it is, uh, is some investment firm. I actually, uh, the name rings the bell, but I don't recall the details. Uh, do you know who is? Yeah, the investors in the company, uh, but I don't remember many many details. But I think 
I don't recall the details of them. Do you know who he is? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, he's uh, one of the investors in the company, and of course he's, I think. Did you, uh, do, do you know how invested in, in Theranos? Uh, I, I don't remember the name of the firm, but it was the person who was uh, the liaison between us is what I remember. And, and I guess when you recall liaising with, with Theranos, um, did you have an understanding that, um, I guess, capital would be um, what you'd be liaising with, or that he was a source of the capital for? I, I didn't know by name that this person, uh, but I knew that was uh, managing uh, investments in Silicon Valley. It's what I heard from him, actually, when I met with him. Do, do you recall an instance where uh, came in for a blood draw at a Walgreens store in Arizona? You know, I remember uh, it was obviously a important occasion because having a Walmart guy going, going to Walgreens uh, was special. So I do remember it for that reason, but I don't remember the exact uh, details of that. I, I guess, I, I think I know where you're going, but can you just explain why it was special for that reason? Because they compete with each other, and I'm pretty sure I would walk into Walgreens store if they didn't have to, would be my guess. <laughs> the, uh, um, Do you recall what the purpose of his visit was uh, when, he was, when he was going into that Walgreens store in Arizona? If I recall, uh, I think he wanted to see our process, uh, but in, again, I don't recall the exact details of the visit because I don't think I was involved with the, with the details of it. But I remember, I think he had gone to actually Arizona uh, for that, uh, not to Palo Alto, is my memory. Do you, do you recall if uh, or other project managers um, consulted you about a process to to make the Walgreens was planning on visiting look nicer before his visit? I don't recall, but it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, uh, I'll hand you a document uh, I'm marking as Exhibit 243. Uh, for the record, Exhibit 243 is a document date stamped TS-1044293. Do you recognize this document? I do. What is Exhibit 243? It's an email from, and then I forwarded the email to Ms. Holmes. Oh, why did you forward this to Ms. Holmes? Probably just FYI for her to keep on the loop. W was that a, a common occurrence that you'd pass on information to her and vice versa? Yes. Uh, I mean, is it fair to say were there areas of the company, I mean we talked a lot about your responsibilities earlier today, was it your normal practice to keep her updated about what was going on in the, in the areas that you managed? Not always. Uh, there was too much stuff that I was doing, and um, if I even typed one line introduction to the emails, I would never get my job done. So sometimes I would just forward and hope that she reads it. Uh, I used to complain to her that she didn't read a lot of my emails, uh, but uh, and sometimes I would put a one-liner, uh, and but most of the times I would send something and I'd go to her office saying, did you read my email? Chances are no. Please pull it up so we can talk. So if it was that important, then I would do that. I mean, did you generally keep uh, her updated about VIP visits? No. Um, you know, this concept of VIP was, I don't know where it came from, but the answer is no. Uh, I didn't. Uh, if it was somebody that she cared about, then I, chances are yes, but if it is somebody didn't care about, then I won't. Well, where did the concept of VIP demos yeah. come from? Um, I think what happened was, and this is my guess, because I don't think I came up with this name, because I don't like it. And I don't think uh, Elizabeth either. Uh, what was a VIP about these demos or meetings was the fact that I was in the room, or Elizabeth was in the room, or both of us in the room. And uh, a lot of times when we collected the samples, if they went to Clear Lab, the Clear Lab would just put them on the stack and batch process them. And the product manager sometimes would uh, uh, pull the chains by saying, "This is VIP because Sunny was in the room, so you better process it right away." Uh, or Elizabeth was in the room. So that's kind of my understanding because. At least in the CLIA lab, when I heard this word a lot, this is a VIP sample, and I used to say, what the heck is a VIP sample? And this is how I found out. So I think it came about in that context. And, and I guess what was your concern with uh, the PM sort of prioritizing these samples in the CLIA lab? Well, it was, no, I didn't have a concern. I just didn't like the name because I didn't think a lot of these demos we were doing actually really were VIPs, and the PMs were not able to make their call. They just thought because I was in the meeting and I did the demo, so it must be important. And a lot of times people would come and meet with us and 
I mean, they were important, but they were not very important. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, if uh, the sample got delivered eight hours later, that was just fine. But the I didn't follow up, uh, follow uh, you know, chase this thing, and these guys just got into the habit of saying, well, if I don't d deliver the results, then he's going to be breathing on, on my neck, so I better move it faster. What gave you the impression that uh, Ms. Holmes didn't like the uh, the term VIP? Because we never talked about it. I mean, if it was something that was her uh, word, then she would have used it in front of me also, but I don't recall her using it that much, if, if, if ever. Who did you consider important? You know, in, in a way, if we are meeting with somebody, they're important, but we used to have a lot of people, for example, Walgreens was used to bring their guests to us, so on a tour of California, so that they can meet with us, and they would always take them to the Palo Alto store because it was nicer. I didn't consider them as important because I was being courteous to Walgreens by being in those uh, demos. Uh, so, important would be, uh, you know, people we that, who are strategic to us, people who are helping us grow the business. Some hospitals we will meet, we know that they would help us with samples on the future, for example, with our R&D. You know, those people were important. And invest, prospective investors would be important to you? I mean, they, they would be important, but honestly, I wouldn't put um, VIP to them. I would say VIP, most part. Maybe not, but I would for his stature, uh, but not because he's an investor. Uh, so investors were important, but at the same time, they come and they see us and they don't like us, that's just fine. I mean, you know, I, I was not necessarily saying this investor, <coughs> all hands on the deck, make sure everything was perfect. Uh, media would be, would be VIP because they would write, us, write about us. So if media, somebody from VIP, if media came, I would say, make sure this everything goes well fine because this guy's going to write about us. The, uh, the, me the message in 243 refers to the fact that a TV, bamboo tree, lamp, and desk Yep. Uh, are placed were placed inside of Walgreens for the visit. Do you yes. see that? Yes. Um, and it says Wags corporate team is not aware that it, this is currently in the store. Yes. What, what I guess was it Theranos is a normal practice to have a TV, bamboo tree, lamp, and desk in Walgreens centers at this time. Yeah. So uh, if you had gone to our Palo Alto location, like I said, it was just beautiful. We had all of this and more, and our design uh, included all of that stuff. And in many of these stores, we actually had this TV where, you know, you would sit and get a blood draw, and you'll be looking at a TV with fish floating in water. Kind of calming effect. We used to also give people a bottle of water to calm them down. It also made them bleed better. So, uh, but we had these trees and, and music and all this stuff. Unfortunately, half of the locations in Arizona, the rooms or the spaces that Walgreens gave us were pretty terrible. Uh, as you can see here, we couldn't even hang a TV because somebody could steal it. Uh, so and this is what he was saying due to loss prevention considerations. So the Walgreens guys will say, oh, no, no, no TV, somebody's going to steal it. Uh, so they won't let, it, let us. But our deal with Walgreens in Arizona was a large number of these stores would be what we call gold stores, which is no space, our TV. And we used to pay for this, all of this stuff. So our plan was every store should look nice because our customers are only there for a minute or two. Let's treat them nice. and. Uh, in some stores, that was not the case. This ha seems like one of those, um, you know, we call them bad stores. And what we wanted to see what our experience really looks like as we grow in, in, in many of the other stores. I mean, I wish I could have directed him to one of the stores which looked like the locations we actually were building, but this was not the case here. I guess, were, were you concerned that your creating experience differed from, you know, what he'd actually experienced if his last name weren't Walton? Uh, I mean, People treat the VIP customers better anyway, so I don't think he was being misled uh, with, through this impression. Like I said, if he had gone to the other stores where we actually had all the setup, then you, one could argue that they, he would be misled thinking all stores are like that, but that was not the case. We were in the early stages, we, were, we ideally wanted all stores to be beautiful, and we actually offered to pay for them also. Uh, but again, Walgreens considerations were a big roadblock in some of these stores, but when we got an opportunity to put a TV, maybe he would hang it there. Uh, and my guess is, I don't know if we removed it or not, if, if we could make something nicer and we paid for it, usually Walgreens didn't complain after it was done. Uh, is, for example, in the Palo Alto store, we paid for it, we fixed the bathroom, we put nice tiles. Walgreens didn't complain. I mean, they were fine with us spending money making the stores nicer. I'm going to give it 243 to the sign.
so, so I'd like to change gears a little bit since we, we started talking a little bit about the Walgreens relationship. Mm. And I guess I just want to take us back in time from the sort of the gold store situation that we were talking about in 2014 a minute ago to, yeah. um, to when Theron was first started partnering with Walgreens. Sure. Uh, wh when was that and what do you recall about those initial conversations? I think we first met with them in March of 2010. Uh, we had a phone conversation with them initially. Uh, there was a person there, and I don't know if he found us or we found him. I'm not sure how that came about. But we had a phone conversation, and uh, he invited us to come to Chicago uh, soon after that. And uh, so Elizabeth and myself, we went to Chicago, and we met. He had a, organized a meeting there, uh, and we met there. It was March of 2010, sorry. And what was the what was the I guess the original business model for partnering with Walgreens? Well, we were going to explore uh, initially when we went there. You know, we said, look, we have this technology and the capability and the vision of you know doing micro volume, small volume. Uh, we think we can put uh, you know some tests and some devices in your stores. The, the ultimately what became phase two is what we were leading with initially. We thought that would be phase one, which is the on-site putting a device in Walgreens. So so, so it's fair to say, when, back in this, again, really early time frame, um, the, the business plan for Walgreens was to have a distributed TSPU in the store. Yes. Um, was there any discussion at that time about having a uh, sort of a, a central CLIA lab mo to supplement the device in store? Or Yeah, I mean, we wanted to be in CLIA lab business because over time we thought, it's, we're going to learn a lot. I mean, and how CLIA lab, labs work. More importantly, our business model uh, actually, I, I take that back. The Clear Lab was always part of the plan. The reason is the way we were thinking about distributing the TSPUs back then required a Clear Lab. Required a Clear Lab. Do you want to stop right or you'll be at five minutes? Oh, we well, can finish your answer. Okay. Required a Clear Lab because Clear Lab was going to provide the oversight. Remember, I talked about the protocols talking to the cloud and protocols coming to the device? That was going to be all part of the Clear Lab. So Clear Lab was required even for that model. I'm going to go off the record at 3.56 to change tapes. Off the record. 